Ông quay cho. Bảo ông chỉ là cả vật to, cái chân đại ca thì tạm là cả. Nông cụ là việc cả từ xã Mỹ Tây ở đại diện cao về cái đại lục. Nôn chí, nằm ở làng thu hợp đến thần thàn, nó bắt luôn. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Your Honours, parties, and members of the public. This afternoon, I'll be presenting Nunchi's case for three of the four security centers that are charged now. Kang Ta Chan, Bukhansen, and Phnom My colleague, Victor Kope, will then conclude our presentation for today by discussing the fourth and final security center, namely S21. So let me begin by first laying out the co-prosecutor's case to which we're responding in these closing arguments. And in full loyalty to the Manichaean narrative, the co-prosecutor's argued that security centers were designed by the CPK as a means to secretly carry out sadistic torture and ultimately to conduct massive unlawful killings. Once again, however, the available evidence fails to support the prosecutor's case. As you heard this week, and as you see in their closing brief, the co-prosecutors mostly rely on out-of-court documents that have low probative value. Mr. President, this is not good enough. The stronger live evidence that we heard in this courtroom throughout the trial instead shows that security centers were lawful prisons. They were meant to detain and re-educate people suspected and ultimately found to have committed the highest offenses against the state, including treason. In a nutshell, this was lawful. Today I'll be presenting our response site by site. Although I know at the outset that given the limited time that we have to discuss these three large crime sites, I'll be being very brief and selective in the issues that we discuss. However, as you know, full arguments on each site appear in our briefs. Let me start and focus today on the largest of the three sites, which is Krang Ta Chan Security Center. Your Honours, as you know, Krang Ta Chan was located in Tramkok District in the southwest zone. Now I'll specifically be beginning with two preliminary issues. The first of these is the lack of credibility of the two star civil parties of the Krang Ta Chan trial centre, Sai Sen and Mir Sokka, who we've discussed at length throughout these closing presentations As you may recall, these two civil parties were adolescents when they were at Krang Ta Chan. Yet at the same time, both of them claim to have seen everything and known In truth, however, their claims are simply not believable at all. Now, earlier on today, my colleague Liv Sovana had discussed the Supreme Court Chamber's findings on the lack of credibility of the appeal witness Samsidi. That chamber said that some city's account was, and I will quote here, inherently implausible and highly improbable. Well, Mr. President, to put Sai Sen and Mir Sokka in perspective with some city, the accounts of Sai Sen and Mir Sokka go way beyond the some city level. Mr. President, you yourself might recall that you twice warned Mr. Sokka that, quote, if you are trying to overstate, there will be consequences, unquote. As we detail in our briefs, we don't have the time to go into here. Sai Sen and Mr. Sokka's accounts 
would not give an underpass. They're full of exaggerations. They remain impossibly vague. And it seems that there may have been other motivations influencing their testimony. In short, both civil parties lack any credibility or reliability. And what this means your Honours, is that you cannot safely base any of your findings solely on their accounts. And even if their accounts were corroborated by other evidence, the bottom line is that their accounts themselves are unreliable. Moving now to the second preliminary issue I'd like to discuss. This issue is the lack of reliability of the documentary evidence that's used so heavily by the prosecutors in relation to not only Krangta Chan Security Center, but also the Trump properties, which is another crime site that I'll discuss in more detail next week. Now, most of the documents that the co-prosecutors use are part of the so-called Trumkot district records. And again, we detail at length in our brief the evidentiary limitations of these documents. And these are arguments that I can only summarize here. Your Honours. Of the many, many Trumkot district records the co-prosecutors use on Krangta Chan and Trumkot, only one, only one was an original. And this original did not substantiate key prosecution arguments, nor did we, the defense, have access to it. The rest of the Trumkot district records are copies or even copies of copies. They're unauthenticated, and as this chamber has itself admitted, they can never really be authenticated. As such, they are entirely unreliable. It's equally disturbing that the co-prosecutors did not even bother to try to establish the authenticity of any of the Trump court uh, records uh, they use. It's their duty to do so, as we explain in our brief. And the way that they ignore this is a key example of what my colleague Victor Coppe discussed earlier today. And that is that there is an assumption that the co-prosecutor's case is true and does not need to be meaningfully proven. To put it bluntly, Your Honours, if I may, this cannot fly in a proper court of law. As it stands, none of the Tramcock district records used by the co-prosecutors but one can even be proven to be authentic. In any event, all of them, all of them, are out-of-court evidence. This means that they can only ever have limited probative value, especially when they're not corroborated by any credible, in-court, live witness evidence. And one of the reasons I've spent some time on these two preliminary issues is that these issues, and I'm talking about civil party and witness credibility problems, and also the problems of using out-of-court evidence, these issues are examples of problems with the evidence that the co-prosecutors have put forward or throughout this case. So let me now review some of the core issues concerning the facts at Krantachan. My first, in terms of structure, the testimonies that were offered during the trial showed that the highest CPK hierarchical level that was closely involved in operational decision-making at Krantachan was Sector 13. It cannot be shown beyond reasonable doubt that Southwest Zone Secretary and Standing Committee member Tam Mok had deep operational involvement. It's even less possible Indeed, it's actually impossible to establish the knowledge 
the the main evidence in this regard, as you'll recall, Your Honours, is his alleged visits to Krang Tachan. However, when you look at the evidence, you see that it is far too vague and insufficient to even show that he visited there, let alone that he gained relevant knowledge about its operations whatsoever. Now I'm moving to the next issue, Your Honours. And this is the legality of arrests and detention In accordance with the national uh, defence and security policy that my colleague Liv Savannah has just discussed, prisoners of Khan Chachan were lawfully arrested and detained following thorough, genuine investigative measures. If you recall, the live evidence from Krang Tachan confirms that there were legal and factual bases for arrests. It shows that monitoring activities were often conducted prior to arrests and that detainees were usually interrogated about activities. The witness Vong Sarun was the only person who appeared in court and testified about being interrogated directly. She explained that she was questioned only once, and it concerned unlawful activities and participating in spy networks. She was released after a week, and she states that she was never mistreated during her interrogation or subsequent detention. Now, as for the question of torture, and this is very important, Your Honour. I have to highlight the fact that there is no reliable live evidence that torture was used at Krang Tachan. First, what the co-prosecutors rely on, as they always do, is a series of the unreliable Trumkop district records that I've just discussed. Second, what they do is then rely on the supposedly corroborating evidence, largely featuring the testimony of the unreliable civil party Sai who I've also just discussed. Thirdly, the co-prosecutors rely on the written statements of three people who did not testify. One of them is even dead. And finally, the only remaining evidence is from Wong Saroon, who said that she heard people being tortured and who testified that she herself was not mistreated. However, Wong Saroon's testimony about what she claims she heard is not corroborated. While the co-prosecutors alleged yesterday that her testimony confirmed torture, the reality is that her evidence is not specific enough to show that the sounds and the conversations she heard were indeed provoked by acts of what would legally be considered torture, a legal definition that my colleague Liz Silvana has just discussed with you earlier today. Mr. President, this is it. We do not have any reliable testimony about torture at Krang Tachan. No former interrogator testified at trial. Two former guards who did testify before you ultimately undermined some so-called accepted truth of the Manichaean narrative, such as detainees' livers being eaten or the use of plastic bags to suffocate detainees. Furthermore, as I'm sure you'll recall, Mr. President, the evidence shows that there was a thick plantation between the detention buildings and the interrogation. This means that at the time it was impossible impossible for detainees to see what was happening during interrogation. Ultimately, what this all means is that you cannot find, beyond reasonable doubt, based on the available evidence, that torture occurred at Krang Turning now then 
the for allegedly participating in a quote-unquote secret struggle within the DK or for allegedly committing rape. Now the co-prosecutors, unsurprisingly, try to minimize the nature of the offenses that led people to be detained at Krang As you heard this week and as you read in their closing briefs, they underscored arrests for light offenses like stealing food or breaking spoons or holes. However, this is misleading and it fails to take into account in particular Two key facts. First, people who were arrested for such offences were repeat offenders. Their arrest typically followed several attempts at re education, and this is something we indeed detailed at length in our document presentation two years ago. Second, we need once again to keep the context in mind. And this is a context that all of my colleagues have already discussed today. Democratic Kampuchea was in a state of emergency. It suffered food and supply shortages. For that reason, DK was legitimately and logically trying to introduce a collectivized way of living through cooperatives, which is something that I'll discuss in more detail next week. But for now, it's important to note that in light of this traumatic situation, even stealing or hiding food or breaking spoons or hose repeatedly may legitimately and often rightfully have been seen as a threat to internal stability since it worsened the shortage crisis. And in any event, as we detail in our brief, there is substantial evidence that most people were detained at Krang Tachan due to suspected participation in treason or other serious offences, and not just because of mere food stealing. Next, Your Honours, the co-prosecutors argued that some people were detained at Krang Tachan simply because they belonged to a specific category that was allegedly targeted by the CPK. These categories include, for example, Vietnamese, so-called new people, spouses of other detainees, and former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. However, once again, the evidence shows this claim to be completely false. Only civil party Sai Sen said that there was a detainee from Krang Tachan, from Hanoi, unquote. However, this does not even allow us to confirm that the detainee was actually Vietnamese, or even less so, why he was arrested. This is therefore completely insufficient to support the fact that Vietnamese were detained at Krang Tachan because of their ethnicity or nationality. Again, it was only the civil party Sai Sen who said uh, something about the arrest of new people at However, as I've already explained before, his whole evidence has no probative value whatsoever. We also heard the testimony of the witness Vong Sarun, who was arrested following her husband's arrest. However, as I've already discussed, she said that she was interrogated about her own possible involvement in unlawful activities. As you can clearly see, this shows that the primary motive for her arrest was those unlawful activities and not the fact that she was the wife of another detainee. As for the fourth category, 
former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials, who the co-prosecutors have highlighted at length in both their briefs and in their oral presentations. We will be having a detailed presentation on this group next week. For now, what is clear from the evidence is that people were arrested at Krantachan because of the activities they conducted and not because of their special identities. Moving on now to the living and working conditions of Krantachan. As we've explained earlier today, and I mentioned a moment ago, Democratic Kampuchea was in a constant state of emergency. Unfortunately, as a result, the living conditions and security centers were tough, just like they were in the rest of the country. However, Your Honours, such hardship was never inflicted by the CPK upon detainees deliberately. On the contrary, evidence shows that the CPK tried to improve living conditions. At Krungtachan, for example, DDT was sprayed to combat malaria and to reduce the number of sick detainees. And this fact alone is enough to undermine the idea that Krantachan was a blunt instrument of death where conditions of detention were deliberately imposed with the intention of causing severe harm. This is just not true. As for working conditions, only Vong Saru testified about alleged hardship. She stated that she became ill from carrying earth. However, her testimony is insufficiently detailed to prove that such hardship reaches the legal level required for the crime against humanity of torture or the crime against humanity of enslavement. Finally, regarding the alleged rapes put forward by the co-prosecutors, Your Honours, the evidence precludes a finding beyond reasonable doubt that they occurred. As you may remember, the live evidence on this was mixed. Two former guards denied that this ever happened. Only civil party Saisen insisted that it did. Even then, however, he did not witness these acts himself. And as I've discussed multiple times now, Saisen's overall evidence is not reliable. For that reason, Mr. President, you cannot base any findings solely on Saisen's testimony. And since his account is the only one alleging that rape occurred, you accordingly cannot find, again, beyond reasonable doubt, that rape indeed occurred at Krantachar. Let me now move to discuss the alleged killings, extermination and enforced disappearances at The closing order and the co-prosecutors claim that 15,000 people died at Krangtachan. However, there is no credible evidence of executions at Krangtachan. Uh, Only two, two people, people confirmed that, that they saw executions or bodies at Krantachan. Once again, they are the wholly unreliable civil parties, Sai Sen and Mir Sokha. Apart from them, there is not one single individual who witnessed an execution at Krantachan. Furthermore, you'll have heard the co-prosecutors mention this and seen in their brief they refer to a so-called forensic study conducted by expert on burned vegetable from Kantachan. However, that forensic study was not a proper forensic investigation. As we've explained in our brief, and as my colleague Victor Coppe will discuss next, Vun Vuti did not date the bones he analysed, so we cannot know that they were from the decay. Thus, his study already has low probative value. In any event, however, it's of no help in counting the, the number of alleged deaths at Krangtachan. As you may recall, 
Prior to the decay, Krangtachan used to be a grave site. It was also located closely within the vicinity of the nearest hospital. Because of this, it's obvious that the bones recovered by Vunvati could have been people who died of natural causes before or after the decay. Your Honours, as a consequence, there is far more than reasonable doubt that any bones exhumed were really from Krangtachan. Finally, on Krangtachan, let me return to the purpose of the security system. As we explained in our brief, Krangtachan was primarily a re-education center. Many detainees were released later on once their re-education was complete. And this is clearly what Trumkov District Secretary Peck Chen meant when he testified that Krang Tachan's purpose was, and I quote, to compromise and mediate the conflict and rebuild our solidarity, unquote. Indeed, as we've detailed in our brief, the live evidence in fact only shows that many people were released from Krangtachan. Obviously, however, the co-prosecutors ignored this evidence in their brief. This is sufficient to confirm that Krangtachan was not a place where people were inevitably killed. It was instead a re-education centre from which people could and would be released. And we have to take a look at the next question. Thank you. Your Honours, I will now move on to the second security centre, Okansang, which was located in the northeast zone. As you know, Limited evidence is available on the security center. And conscious of our limited time, we will be focusing primarily on one specific incident that the co-prosecutors emphasized in their case. Therefore, what I'm going to do is begin by very rapidly going through a number of general issues in connection with Okansi before turning to that specific incident. Firstly, as we explain in our brief, what little evidence there is shows that, like everywhere else, arrests and detention at Okansang were factually and legally grounded. In particular, we have some reports which mention the specific reason which led to arrests at Okansang. We have evidence that people were interrogated regarding their suspected activities. Former detainees also testified that they were not mistreated in any way during their detention. Moreover, we know for a fact that there was a review system in place at Okansai. Evidence shows that Division 801 Commander Sal Sarun made decisions to release or recategorize detainees according to the gravity of their conduct. And finally, in terms of the general issues I would like to discuss, the evidence detailed in our brief shows that the detention conditions were not abnormal considering the context of the time. The type of work detainees did did not exceed what is normally required of a person under lawful detention. Mr. President and Your Honours, I will now focus the rest of my discussion on Hukansen on only one incident, especially in light of how heavily the co-prosecutors are relying upon it. In this incident, as you might recall, is the alleged arrest and execution of apparently hundreds of Charai Vietnamese at Okonsai. Three witnesses seem to testify about this event. And according to the co-prosecutors, one telegram allegedly proves Nunchir had knowledge of the incident. However, a close examination proves all this to be untrue. Let's start with the telegram. The telegram, which is document E3-240, was sent on the 15th of June 1977, and it indicates that it was copied to Nunchi, as the co-prosecutors have stressed. 
That telegram reported the arrest in autonomous sector 107 of, and I quote, 209 Vietnamese soldiers, unquote, most of whom were of Jai ethnicity. These people were carrying guns, pistols, grenades, bayonets, US-made backpacks, and also a Vietnamese map. Now, according to the telegram, they claimed that they were, quote-unquote, ordinary people and no longer soldiers, but that following examination, it was assessed that those people were lying. As for the three witnesses who testified, they say that they saw a group of Jarai which arrived at Okonseng and was later taken away. They consistently claim that this event occurred in 1978.